Hereby I open this academic ceremony at Maastricht University. First of all, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Alexander Michael Koch. He will defend his academic thesis, which is titled Identification of Novel Biomarkers in Critically Ill Patients. Um, welcome to all members of the degree committee, uh, and in particular, two supervisors. One supervisor is sitting here in the aula, and the other su supervisor is online, but we don't see him yet. Um, the first supervisor is uh, Dr. Ger Koek. He is a gastroenterologist and hepatologist at Maastricht University Medical Center Plus. Um, and Dr. Professor Frank Takke. He is uh, director of the clinic for hepatology and gastroenterology of Charité University Medical Center in Berlin in Germany. And I hope that we will see him soon on screen. Um, I will introduce the six opponents later during the ceremony because if I mention all those names now, you certainly will forget. And I welcome you here in the uh, aula. Uh, and I also um, welcome all the followers of the live stream. Uh, Mr. Koch, may I invite you to present a summary of your thesis and I wish you success in the coming hour. Thank the you floor very much. is yours. Highly esteemed prorector, highly esteemed members of the Corona, dear family, dear friends, dear audience, thank you for giving me the opportunity to pre present my thesis, Identification of Novel Biomarkers in Critically Ill Patients. Please let me introduce you to this topic by answering two important questions. First, what is a critically ill patient and what is critical care? And second, what is a biomarker? Obviously, you see here a critically ill patient who was treated due to severe acute pancreatitis on our ward in the intensive care unit at the University, University, University Hospital Aachen. Critical illness is characterized by a high risk of imminent death. The main reason for this is vital organ dysfunction. To avoid death, there is an urgent requirement for intensive care. An indispensable condition is the potential reversibility of the clinical situation. If this criterion is not met, it isn't a critically ill, but a dying patient. The concept of critical or intensive care comprises identification, monitoring, and treatment of critical illness. This image displays monitoring, therapeutic measures such as mechanical ventilation, circulatory support, and drug therapy. Prompt initial and sustained care to support vital organ dysfunction is inevitable to achieve the best possible patient's outcome. The prerequisites for this are well-trained interprofessional treat uh, treatment teams and a modern, well-equipped intensive care unit. Second question, what is a biomarker? A biomarker describes a measurable indicator of a patient's clinical condition that can be measured accurately and reproducibly. Here are some examples of different categories of clinically used biomarkers. These can be vital signs such as blood, such as blood pressure, pulse, or body temperature or examinations like ECG, ultrasound, or computer tomography. The term biomarker is most often used in the context of blood value analyses, and there is a large number of different blood values that are used as clinical biomarkers. Here's, uh, here's examples, hemoglobin, cholesterol, and blood sugar. Biomarkers can have different areas of application. They can be used as diagnostic biomarkers, such as ultrasound examination for the detection of maybe acute appendicitis. They can be applied as prognostic biomarkers. Here's an example, cholesterol in cardiovascular disease. They can be safety biomarkers, for instance, ECG controlling under psychiatric medication. Blood, measure, uh, blood pressure measurements in the intensive care unit are typical examples for monitoring biomarkers and blood Sorry, and blood sugar measurements by a general practitioner can represent screening biomarkers, for instance, for diabetes. The basis for the scientific work in this thesis is biobanking. Let me shortly explain what biobanking is. After informed consent from relatives or legal representative, we obtained blood samples from critically ill patients um, at our ward at the time point 
of admission to the intens intensive care unit, so mostly prior to therapeutic interventions. Then we collected samples for longitudinal measurements on day three and on day seven during the clinical course. We centrifuged the blood samples to obtain serum or plasma as the liquid uh, components of the blood and pupated them into small tubes with a volume of approximately one milliliter for simplifying further processing. This procedure is called aliquotation. Next, we immediately deep freeze the aliquoted patient samples in laboratory freezers at minus 80 degrees Celsius. Simultaneously, we collected anonymized clinical patient data in a computerized database. When required, we defreeze samples to work on clinical questions. For automatic, blood, for automatic blood sample analyses, we used the technique of enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays, short ELISA. Patient, patient samples are pipetted into small pits on an ELISA plate. You can here see an ELISA plate. And um, at the ground of each pit, this is a pit or a well on the ELISA plate, is a specific antibody for the molecule, molecule to be investigated. The molecule binds to the antibody, and the enzyme linked to that antibody induces a color reaction on the ELISA plate. This is a color reaction on the ELISA plate. And each pit on the plate corresponds to, the, to one patient sample. And different color intensities reflect the concentration of the investigated molecule. After this reaction, automatic ELISA systems measure color intensities and transcript them to laboratory values for further data processing. We then performed statistical analyses and correlated the collected anonymized patient's data, such as medical history, vital signs, laboratory values, results of examinations, drugs, interventions, and outcome to the measured biomarkers. I would like to present you some of the results of the scientific work comprised in my thesis. Part one focuses on biomarkers of systemic inflammation in critical disease. First another, um, first, another question to answer. What is an inflammation? An inflammation is the body's immune system's response to an irritant. Controlled local inflammation is a part of the physiological healing process, here depicted by an example of a twisted ankle. We can see a red, swollen foot, and we can imagine that this foot hurts and doesn't function properly. These are common clinical signs for local inf inflammation. It is very important to note that this is a local inflammation without infection. Another foot with local inflammation here as part of the physiological healing process. But in this case, local inflammation is additionally driven by infection. Taking together, it's most important to distinguish between non-infectious, sterile inflammation and infectious inflammation. In critically ill patient, patients, inflammation is often uncontrolled, not localized, and affects the whole body. This excessive inflammation can be either of non-infectious origin, such as heart attack, trauma, or surgery, or of infectious origin, as sepsis or septic shock. The most feared consequence is multi-organ failure, which can affect all vital organs. Inflammatory stress results in cell death in various organ systems, leading to organ dysfunction. K18 cytokine fragments, in here short, shortly uh, named M30 due to the detection method, are parts of the cellular structure. They become detectable in the blood when cells of different organs die. We found increased levels of M30 in all critical ill patients as compared with healthy controls. Those findings were independent of the causative type of inflammation, infectious or non-infectious inflammation. M30 reflected the severity of critical illness as it was associated with clinical using, use scoring systems like the Apache 2 score. We found highest M30 in liver cirrhosis, hinting at the liver as the major, major source of M30. High M30 at ICU admission were a predictor of a potential death at the ICU. Here you see on the left side, Kaplan-Meier curve survival, and this displays the following. At the beginning, all patients are alive, and every step in this curve is a dead patient. The gray curve predicts patients with low M30, and the black curve depicts patients with high M30. In conclusion, 
Patients with high M30 at ICU admission have a greater risk to die during ICU treatment than patients with low M30. Part two of the thesis focuses on the role of specific adip adipokines in critically ill patients. High blood sugar levels are a common finding in critically ill patients with excessive inflammation, uh, either infectious or non-infectious origin. These are the results of the body's stress reaction to critical disease. Recently, the term diabetes of injury has been proposed in this context as it comprises characteristics of type 2 diabetes, especially insulin resistance. Insulin resistance itself is strongly linked to excess fat mass and obesity. Historically, adipose tissue was considered only as an inactive energy store. In the past decades, adipose tissue has been identified as a hormonally active organ system that directly influences metabolic and inflammatory responses. Adipokines are proteins that are mainly secreted by adipocytes and exert these hormonal functions. They may represent an important causal link in the complex interaction of insulin resistance, high blood sugar levels, and excessive systemic inflammation in critically ill patients. In this thesis, we investigated the adipokine bisphatine. Bisphatine is known to be involved in systemic inflammation. It has direct effects on immune cells and potentially promotes excessive cytokine release. Visfatine has also been linked to chronic inflammatory diseases uh, such like rheumatoid arthritis and chronic inflammatory bowel diseases and to acute inflammation, as, a, as an example, sepsis of newborn babies. We investigated visfatine as relatively few data exist on visfatine in adult critical disease. We could demonstrate that this fatine is significantly associated with, with disease severity and biomarkers of systemic inflammation. Although this fatine is an adipokine, we did not observe a correlation of this fatine with the body mass index or known diabetes. This fatine levels at ICU admission were predictive of ICU survival. Patients with low visfatine at ICU admission had a lower risk to die during ICU treatment as patients with high visfatine. The third part of the thesis deals with biomarkers of bio biological stress in critical illness. The causative insults of critical illness, such like sepsis, sepsis shock, cardiogenic shock, severe acute pancreatitis, bleeding, metabolic disturbances, trauma, or burns, and the degree of systemic inflammation, the extent of organ failure, and the dimension of hemodynamic instability substantially contribute to biological stress in critical disease. But also the burden of therapeutic measures of critical care, such as vasopressor or volume therapy, machines for organ support, and side effects of medication adds up in biological stress. As a biomarker for biological stress, we investigated atrial natriuretic peptide, ANP, which derives from the heart. In healthy humans, ANP is involved in body fluid regulation. In critically ill patients, besides fluid regulation, ANP has been attributed to inflammation and metabolism. Highest levels of ANP has been reported in the critical states of sepsis, septic shock, multi-organ failure, and lethal condition. We therefore investigated ANP in our cohort, among others, as a predictor for clinical outcome. We could describe ANP as a potential prognostic biomarker for mortality, where high ANP is associated with an increased risk to die during ICU treatment and during the follow-up period of two years. Finally, I would like to conclude. Multiple organ dysfunction is a key characteristic of critically ill patients. Causative is a broad spectrum of severe medical conditions resulting in systemic inflammation. A biomarker is a measurable indicator of a patient's clinical condition. Biomarkers are valuable tools for diagnosing, monitoring, and prognostication. The identification of biomarkers might contribute to medical innovation and personalized medicine in the intensive care setting. Thank you very much for your attention, and I give back the word to the highly esteemed Prorector. Thank you very much for a clear presentation of your summary of your thesis. Um, and we are opening now the opposition with um, 
The chair of the thesis assessment committee, Professor Van der Horst, he is professor of intensive care medicine at the Maastricht University Medical Center Plus. Professor Van der Horst, het woord is van u. Thank you, dear candidate. First, I want to compliment you on your large thesis. And with that compliments, I also want to include your supervisors. I read it with interest and because of your background and my background, there are some similarities. And based on uh, what you presented, I do have some questions. And the first question is, what is the key characteristics of critically ill patients? What is the key characteristic? Uh, uh, highly, uh, highly esteemed opponent. First of all, thank you much, very much for your kind words. And um, thank you very much for the question. When I stood correct, understood correctly, uh, you wanted to know about the characteristic of a critically ill patient. You, you stated in the first sentence of your thesis and also your first proposition, it's that multi-organ dysfunction is the key characteristics. And on your last slide, you now presented that it was a key characteristic. So okay. uh, you, you also helped yourself with that answer already in your presentation. <laughs> OK. Uh, OK. <laughs> this, is a, this is quite quite difficult questions. Um, I think multi-organ failure is the characteristic of critically ill patient because it is um, the end of all inflammation. So it sums up all the complications we have in a critically ill patient. So you're totally correct. It has to be it's the key characteristic of critically ill patients. That's totally right. Thank you. Um, in all your chapters, you use uh, organ disease severity scores. Uh, do you consider them mandatory or very useful in critically ill patients? The definition of organ failure, I think the definition of organ failure is most important in, in critical ill care because you have to describe very, very thoroughly and properly the clinical situation of the patient. And if you understand the disease and you can underst understand the expectable prognosis, then you can do the right measures for therapy, for further diagnostication to improve the patient prognosis. I think this is the most important thing. Yeah, but then do you need, therefore, a severity score or do you need a biomarker? Of, 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 of course, a highly esteemed opponent, of, of course you can... can um, you can and you have to use clinical scoring system for the uh, evaluation of prognosis and disease, disease severity. For instance, in sepsis, the new sepsis 3 definition uh, relies on the well-known SOFA score, yeah, um, once, once uh, introduced uh, in, in the beginning of the 90s as the uh, severe organ failure assessment score, which comprises the most common um, organ failures I uh, showed in the slide beginning from brain ending in coagulation. You have heart, you have lungs, you have kidneys. Yeah, so this is very important to have a, a score to um, set disease severity. That's very important. We have the SOFA score, which is very important. The SOFA score has been changed in so many ways from, from SOFA score in the initial phase in the 90s to the sepsis 3 definition through the definitions in acute and chronic liver failure we use on our ward. So I think it's a very, very important score to clarify the patient's disease severity. You have to understand that. Yeah, and you use in different chapters SOFA and Apache 2 and SUBS 2. Um, did you on purpose use two or three of them, or is it more that the reviewers recommended you to give that information? Um, highly esteemed opponent, this is a, a very intriguing question. We have a very, very large database, and we have computerized data. On our, so we have all the scores. The, scoring, score, the scores are calculated automatically. And of course, if you have the Apache 2 score, you don't need the SEPS 2 score. Yeah? So, we rely on SOFA. We think SOFA is the best, best score for us as maybe I, I, I may say model intensivists because it probably reflects all important organ systems. But the SOFA score is a right now picture of the patient, while the Apache score brings in comorbidities and something the patient brings into the ICU. And this is not included in the SOFA score. 
all your answers up till now are really helpful because I hoped you give these answers. And now we go into your thesis in depth. Then you have all those biomarkers. Did you do in your multivariate analysis put in those severe G scores as well? This is the most highly esteemed opponent. Sorry, this is the most important question. What will we do with the results of this biomarker research? So, I'm a clinical physician. I'm an inter intensivist, and I treat patients. And I treat patients in a university hospital. And if you work in a university hospital, you try to collect all the patient data you have, yeah? and then to get a broad picture of your patient, and you get the opportunity to induce science and to find novel things. If you ask me what parameters were the most interesting parameters, there's M30, which is quite an interesting parameter, but which has been already used and implemented into clinical scores. Yeah, but, but you, you, you measure so far Apache 2, SUBS 2, then there are already a lot of organs that are uh, there is a proxy for liver failure, there is a proxy for renal failure. So if you then add on top of that prediction or risk score your biomarker, did you use that in your multivariate analysis and did it stand out still? Uh, a highly esteemed um, opponent, uh, now I understand the question. No, we didn't, we didn't do studies on additional scores so that we combined the traditional scores with a novel biomarker. Yeah, there are some um, examinations um, who, who've done this prior, maybe if you have the, the, the King's College criteria for the, for the estimation of survival risk in acute liver failure, there has been, in addition, for instance, with M30 to better display the prognosis of the patient with ACLF. But we didn't do that, but this might be a future work. I think a very I'm, important... I'm, because of the time, I'm happy with the answer, and I'm especially happy with you telling me that it was the real good question. So um, <laughs> therewith, I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you. Thank you, Professor van der Horst. Um, the opposition will be continued by Professor Strnat. He is uh, occupying the chair of the Heisenberg Professorship for Translational Gastroenterology at the RWTH Aachen University in Germany. Professor Strnat. See, dear candidate, um, we share a passion in um, collecting high, uh, well characterized clinical cohorts, and uh, we both know how difficult is that. So, uh, uh, since every research is only as good as the cohort that you collect, uh, can you describe how you did that? Were you able to collect really every patient who was in your clinic, and you know what what was the management work behind that? A highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question. Indeed, it's not difficult to do this patient sample collection in the clinical routine. As I presented, we um, included all patients suitable, so age above 18, not pregnant patients, in our cohort. So we had all patients we regarded as intensive care patients. We all know, we all, as inter intensivists know, that there are bed and breakfast patients we excluded those patients. Possible patients who stayed just one day on the ICU, we didn't include in the study. So we had patients who had a certain disease severity. Yeah? And then we collected the material of all of the patients. And as I said, we tried at, to, to collect the first data at the time point of admission. So doors open, patient comes in, and he gets the first catheters, and then we draw the blood. And then we, we centrifuge and did it into the deep freeze. Yeah? So we had material potentially prior to um, therapeutic intervention. But as you know, that's not always given. Uh, maybe the patient comes in into the um, emergency um, uh, care center, uh, then the first treatment uh, is started, and then the patient goes up to the ICU, for instance. So it's not really prior to, to therapy, but it's, it's at the start of the clinical course at an uh, intensive care unit. And you have to have a, a good team which do the samples 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And we have now um, a serum database of approximately 3,000 patients and a 
uh, 80 gigab uh, gigabyte database of patients data. So it's a, it's a huge, huge database we have. So that means kind of technically that every physician who kind of enters the ICU uh, knows what's to be done and kind of uh, does, does it due to, due to a certain SOP or how does yeah. that work? Yeah, we had an SOP. So every doctor on the, on the ICU was informed and was trained to obtain the blood, to do the simple blood processing. And uh, we had some, uh, some students who supported us in this work. And it's, uh, yeah, we did it, we do it since 2006. And it's, it's a, a very good old machine right now. Well, it's it's good machine. <laughs> <laughs> so that means that basically the the physicians know their work, and then they call call a a student probably or no, they or do it for themselves. They do it for themselves. Okay, so the, the nurses the nurses in Germany are about to draw the blood. Yeah, the nurses draw the blood, and the doctor puts it into the centrifuge we have on the ward, and then did the blood pre-processing, and then the page, the, the blood if it's out of the normal working time, it goes to a, a minus 20, 20 degree freezer and is then later next day aliquotated and then deep freezed at, at minus 80. So, so can you roughly say what is the time between collection and freezing? Is it a few hours? Can it be up to 24 deep hours? Deep freezing max, deep freezing minus 80, max 24 hours. Okay. Max. Very good. Yeah. Regularly 12 hours if it's in the night. So even even during weekend you get it. Twenty four hours, seven days, <laughs> three hundred sixty five days a year. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So the other thing which is of of obvious relevance is all the work you do with them. So a lot of them get some kind of blood transfusions. Yeah. They may be on dialysis, which of course changes the levels of of many biomarkers and so on. Do you? Uh, do you somehow account that to exclude these patients or do you do a s additional analysis or how do you handle that? Yeah, a highly esteemed opponent, that's a very intriguing question. Um, we are kind of blind on this eye. So we took all the patient. Yeah? I think the, the strength of our um, collective is that we have all the patients who come in at the ICU. So this is a, a real world data we have and we can rely on. So. Of course, we have patients who get a, a mass transfusion and we change the whole blood, so the values we measure aren't reliable. That's no question, but those are so, just some of the patients. Yeah, or we did a plasma separation in the patients, for instance. So we changed everything, but we didn't exclude the patients. They are on the database, but we could exclude them because we have the data on transfusion, we have the data on plasma separation, and on and on. Yeah? But we kind of did it like a real world experience. Yeah? And if I'm totally aware of the shortcomings of what we did. Yeah? And so it's not, it's not maximum fancy basic science. We just collected the blood and we looked into the blood and tried to find some correlations. We didn't do any mechanistic uh, approaches. We just had it, we looked at our patients and thought, what can we do? What does it mean? Can we give an input? Can we comment on that? So these are the, the, the basics, and this was the impetus for our research. So which of your biomarkers you think will, it, will make it to the kind of mainstream everyday oh, uh, work? To have biomarker research, and if you open PubMed and you type in biomarker research, you get a plethora of manuscripts. And if you see the novel biomarkers we have had in the last, last years, it's the BNP for cardiology. I think it's a, it's a very, important, very important biomarker. We had the PCT, I think it was introduced in 2005. Between that, I couldn't imagine what is really worthwhile and staying. Huh? If you ask me, I think the M30 is quite intriguing. I think this vaccine could be nice because I have investigated adipokines before. Yeah, maybe there is a key to something more. I think the, the, um, the link from systemic inflammation to adipose tissue and metabolism is very intriguing. And I think maybe there can be something. A and P was nice, but we have B and P. So do we really need 
A and P. Thank you. That's all I needed to know. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Strenat. The opposition will be continued by Professor Bolheimer. He is director of the Clinic for Geriatric Medicine of the University Hospital of the RWTH Aachen University in Germany. Professor Bolheimer. Um, dear candidate, thank you very much for this intriguing talk. Um, most of your study participants suffered from pancreatitis, did I? I'm right? I have to <laughs> uh, I have to pwn no. We have not, not all the patients, are, or most of the patients are patients with acute pancreatitis. We, are, uh, we have a uh, gastroenterologic ICU. We have most of the severely ill patients in our area uh, in Nordrhein Westfalen uh, with acute pancreatitis, okay. but we have approximately one or two patients a month with acute pancreatitis, with severe acute necrotizing pancreatitis. Okay, anyway, I, I find it quite interesting because um, acute necrotizing pancreatitis, as far as I remember at the chariot vision, um, is described to be biphasic, has a biphasic course. And so I was wondering um, whether your findings could in any sense fit um, to this model of biphasic course. Mm. And I would be therefore interested if you could um, nonetheless line out, um, how is the actual understanding of pancreatitis and could there any hint from your data, both in terms of diagnostics and also perhaps in terms of treatment? Mm. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for, for your interesting questions. As you, as you already told, acute pancreatitis is biphasic because pancreatitis, severe pancreatitis, is the blueprint for non-infectious inflammation at the beginning and later on, infectious inflammation. So when acute pancreatitis starts, we have non-steroidal inflammation due to the acute pancreatitis. There are no bacteria. It's a steroidal inflammation which can lead into um, multiple organ failure. The patient we saw in the slides is a patient with acute pancreatitis, and this could be a situation without any infections. So first, um, um, talking about terms of treatment, most important treatment in acute pancreatitis, when the patient comes into your ward and you have an acute pancreatitis and you have no clue for an ongoing infection, don't do an antibiotic therapy don't do a prophylactic antibiotic therapy. So withdraw therapy for the goods of the patient. I think this is a very, very important message. Second step is after four to six weeks admission to the ICU, then the necrosis of the pancreatitis began to begin to infect. And there is um, 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 a bacterial invasion from the bowels to the necrosis. Yeah? Uh, and this infects the, um, the necrosis, and as a result, the patient, patients may become septic, and they have a two-spike clinical cause with first multi-organ failure due to non-infectious um, inflammation in acute pancreatitis, and second spike is the sepsis or septic shock due to infected necrosis. And you ask about biomarkers. What can we do? We have a cohort of acute pancreatitis. In our code, approximately 100 or 110 pa patients with acute pancreatitis. But we haven't looked at those biomarkers in, into pancreatitis. But to complete your questions, if I had a wish, what would be a very important biomarker to have in this situation would be a biomarker who can distinguish between non-infectious inflammation and infectious, infectious inflammation. I think all physicians in this room would be glad if we had such a biomarker, so it would make things so much easier. But to my mind, we will never have such a biomarker. This is a real problem. We won't have a biomarker who can say, let's go, it's no infection. So you have to see the whole patient. And as in, we, we, we talked about it some minutes before, we talked about sepsis and sepsis definition. And in the sepsis 3 definition, and we talked about organ failure, the most important things in the new sepsis definition is that we have an infection, yeah, or a very probably likely infection, and we have organ failure. And those both makes the diagnosis, or potential diagnosis of sepsis and infection 
better than a sole biomarker. I think we will never have a biomarker that can distinguish between, between um, um, steroidal and non-steroidal inflammation. And if you go back and have the potential of CRP and PCT in this setting, we use every day, it's quite poor. Would it be possible to make somehow a time map um, of inflammation? Uh, could you f um, put some of your um, cytokines or biomarkers which you have investigated put into this map in, in terms of pancreatitis? Not really. What comes first, risvatin, M30, or? <laughs> Nothing. So it's not possible. I don't, I don't okay. think that they're usable for, yeah. for the question of pancreatitis. Yeah. We, have, we, have some, we have some prognostic biomarkers for uh, acute pancreatitis. So very simple biomarkers, the LDH, lactate dehydrogenase. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's a strict cellular enzyme. And if cells are damaged or are going to die, the LDH is getting free. So in hemolysis, in heart attack, and in necrotizing pancreatitis. And if you have a patient with a steroid inflammation, and you see, oh, he's going into, into necrotize, necrotization. Yeah, you see the LDH is rising. And then you see, of course, because it's steroid inflammation, the CRP is rising. And then two weeks later, the patient has fever. So is it an infection of the necrosis? Is it the ongoing necrotize, necrotization? Is it still non-infectious inflammation? And you have to distinguish between that, but the biomarkers we researched didn't fit into this question. Last question. Um, you favored M30, Risvatin, A and P, but I was a little bit surprised about calprotectin yeah. um, being determined in the blood. I, as a geriatrician, know it only oh, yeah. about in terms of IBD, in the feces. What is the story behind yep. this? Highly steep deployment. That's, that's totally true. It's, it's a well-validated biomarker in chronic bowel disease for disease activity. And I think that's the, the best indication for calprotectin, to be honest. You mm. use it there. It's another inflammatory biomarker in the setting of steroidal or non-steroidal inflammation in the critical ill patient. Um, I don't think that there is a real need to use this biomarker and to, to um, yeah, maybe follow this concept to have another quite unspecific inflammation biomarker. We have a lot. Yeah? And I, I don't think that we come to the point to say, as I, as I um, um, said, said before, to a point that we have one biomarker who explains the situation. I think the most important thing will be we have clinical scores and add them with biomarkers. Or we have a, we have a collection of biomarkers which, um, which um, um, build, uh, depicts the clinical de situation. Yeah. And all modern scores, we are back to the SOFA score, have old biomarkers but clinically connected to display the patient situation. Yeah. Dear candidate, thank you very much for these enlightening answers, and I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you, Professor Bolheimer. Um, the next opponent is Dr. Bergmans. He is internist intensivist at the um, University of Maastricht Medical Center. Thank you, prorector. Um, just like um, my um, predecessors in this corona, I would like to um, uh, congratulate the candidate and also the supervisors for the initiation and um, uh, execution of this um, of all this work, uh, which is uh, presented in this uh, in this thesis. Um, dear candidate, it's a very interesting thesis on critically ill with or without sepsis in intensive care and the role of biomarkers in diagnosis, prognostication, and in monitoring therapy. And as mentioned before, biomarkers are hot. Uh, not only in intensive care, um, but especially intensive care, there are a lot of biomarkers, there's a lot of research, a huge amount of different biomarkers used in various ways, in various diseases or syndromes which we like in intensive care. Um, so I looked forward to this uh, thesis, hoping it would be a guide in the expanding jungle of biomarkers. And after reading the thesis, unfortunately, I'm still a bit lost. Um, so I have some questions. 
Um, the first question is about the numbers in the, the number of patients that are examined. Uh, there are 10 papers and uh, as explained before, you use you have a large cohort of patients uh, which you use for these analysis. Um, and um, um, the patients were categorized as sepsis, uh, non-sepsis, and there is a healthy control group. Um, nevertheless, the numbers of sepsis patients, non-sepsis patients, and even control patients are different in each study. Can you elaborate on that? What is the cause of that? Mm. Esteemed opponent, thank you very much for this interesting and important question. Thank you first for your kind words on my, on my scientific words. It's basically from the same cohort, yeah? but we, we hadn't had full material for each examination in this cohort. So we didn't do the measurements at once and had maybe 250 patient probes and then samples and then did examinations at one time. We did it time after time after time. So mm -hmm. there are different, different um, um, numbers of the cohort study. Second, the control groups were normally healthy blood donors from our blood bank. And mm -hmm. we, we, connected, uh, we, we, we connected to our blood bank if we need new samples, and then we collect the samples from the healthy blood donors. So the, those are groups who are changing. Mm -hmm. yeah. In terms of differenti differentiation, um, as, I, as I told, we, we have a large cohort, we have a real world situation, and it's not quite easy to do a stratification. To our, to our mind, it was not so bad to do a differentiation between sepsis and non-sepsis. Mm -hmm. So sepsis patients were, were those patients who fulfilled okay, sepsis three criteria before it was, uh, was the, the ZERS, mm -hmm. ZERS criteria we, 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 we included. Um, oh, but that's, that, that's okay, because yeah. that's what we have to work with. Uh, yeah. We use the definitions, and yeah. you used it uh, yeah, we as, as you should. have to, have to yeah, um, absolutely. categorize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but um, uh, did you consider to um, uh, use one cohort, one cohort for all these studies? M would that be in terms of design of the study, or maybe even in terms of uh, the outcome, would that, mm. would that not be preferred? Mm. I see the point, you're totally right with it. It would be better if we had one cohort and did all the measurements at one time part with the same cohort. Um, to be honest, it's not so easy to do it. It's not so easy to have the money for all the ELISA plates to do the examinations. So we are not a very high funded uh, working group. So it's not so easy to get all the measures to do the examinations. Mm -hmm. So we did manuscript after manuscript. And so the, the patient cohort changed. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Real life research. <laughs> real, <money. laughs> real life cohort, real life okay. <laughs> research. Yeah. Um, but then, you did 10 separate studies um, with more or less the same um, uh, population. And then in each study, you use one biomarker. Um, did you consider, or maybe even you did the analysis, to combine all these? To, uh, because now nowadays, um, 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 omics-based uh, biomarker panels, uh, combinations of biomarkers, and maybe uh, you suggested yourself in the in the thesis that the mm. CTRP1 is one that we really can't use. Um, but maybe if you combine the biomarkers and then and then do with that analysis, then there are other biomarkers that maybe are not that useful mm. because another one is more useful. Did you consider that, or maybe did you even do that analysis? Esteemed opponent, important questions. We thought about it. We didn't do it already, but we have to do it. Yeah. yeah. I think the answer, because we have the data, and nothing is easier than to do the analysis without further measure measurements on the ELISA. So we have the data. We can do it. So it's time for the next promotion okay. <laughs> yeah. over the next candidate. Yeah. Okay. So there is a lot, yeah. lot of to investigate because we have lots of data yeah and then if you are going to do that analysis um, 
would you consider uh, implementing phenotyping in that analysis? If I had a cohort like you did, <laughs> I would. <laughs> Because uh, what we've seen, what we've seen already in the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, there has been in ARDS, they uh, were there was a proposition of a type H or type L ARDS or COVID associated ARDS with consequences for therapy for ventilator strategy, That's and maybe in the septic patients or non-septic critically ill patients, we need to phenotype these patients, maybe using not only uh, severity of disease scores, but also mm. these biomarkers to say, mm. okay, well, I have a, tape, uh, a type B patient, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then... Yeah, it's still the point. Very intriguing idea. Um, I totally agree that on an ICU, we talk about sepsis patients. And most of all, uh, some of, uh, of us work on an ICU. And there is a totally different kinds of, of septic patients. You have a septic patient with an RDS, yeah? acute lung failure is on the intensive care. We have a patient with an abdominal sepsis, with acute pancreatitis. We have a patient with, uh, after cardiac arrest, yeah, who has maybe a thrombobolic uh, issue in, in, in one of the legs. Yeah? So those are totally different patients, but comprised at the end of sepsis. Yeah? That's, that's a problem, it's a problem of stratification. And I think we as intensivists have to do a better stratification. I think we as biomarker researchers or observers have to do a better uh, stratification. I think that's clear. And I find this idea very, very intriguing to do it, um, to do it in future. To be honest, I have no clear idea how to do it. Yeah. But I think it's intriguing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I think um, as we started, we talked about organ failure, and it's all about organ failure. And I, 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 I took a little bit to get the point from you that you said, yeah, it's the end point of critical air. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. organ failure. And we, as physicians, we, we knew, or intensivists, we have to know how to treat the organ failures. We don't need a gastroenterologist, a nephrologist, a cardiologist. We, as intensivists, have to take care for every organ system. If it's going to be very special, if you need an ERCP from the gastroenterological side, if you need a, a coronary angioplasty, you need a cardiologist, but you have to take as an intensivist all the organ systems yeah. into account. Okay, excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Give the back. Thank you Dr. Bergmans. Uh, the next opponent is uh, Dr. Gevers. <coughs> He is a gastroenterologist and hepatologist at the Maastricht University Medical Center. Dr. Gevers. Well, <coughs> first of all, I also want to congratulate you on your work in this comprehensive thesis and congratulate your supervising team, uh, Dr. Ger Koek, and Professor Frank Tak. And uh, I was for six months uh, as a fellow in your department, so I saw the well-oiled machine myself. <laughs> And that uh, I just want to focus uh, on uh, chapter nine, that's, uh, the, on copeptin. And uh, you investigated whether plasma copeptin levels uh, measured at ICU admission were associated with disease severity, critical illness, and could predict, predict uh, mortality in these critical ill patients. Given this research question, what was the role of the healthy control group? Esteemed opponent, thank you much for your kind words. And thank you very much for your questions. The control group, the, the function of the control group is to distinguish between patients on the ICU with a potentially dysregulated uh, situation of copeptin compared, as, compared to healthy blood donors who have a potential normal regulation. Copeptin, as I exerted in, uh, in, the, in the manuscript, in, in the th uh, thesis, um, is derived from the brain. It's a, it's a reflector of vasopressin yeah, inside the body because it's, it's uh, expressed in equimolar, equimolar amounts. And we tried to have a look in, inside a biomarker who is potentially, yeah, potentially a biomarker for this biological stress. So there is no clear definition what is biological stress yeah. on an ICU. Yeah? We, we, we fitted it in this, in this, um, 
in this uh, slide I had that is the biological stress is, is a mixture of the adverse effects of our therapeutic measures, adverse effects of the disease itself, and parameters who are directly influencing disease severity. And we thought that, that copeptin might have any impact and we could observe some correlation. It's very important to stress out that these are observational studies. We can't say anything about mechanistic issues. We can say, okay, we have a patient with disease X and we have a biomarker there and we see, okay, this is correlated, but if it's causative, it's not to answer from our side. So we mostly try to give a hint to do something else. Okay. And, and uh, uh, did you also consider to uh, include a control group from the normal ward with similar uh, chronic diseases to see how it differentiates bet between critical illness and the absence of critical illness in these groups? Uh, you see, proponent, this would be an idea to do. Yes, you had an, another control group. Maybe you can do it. I, I don't exactly, I'm not exactly convinced if this does give more value, but I don't know. Of course, you can say, okay, totally, totally healthy patients uh, have this level. Patient with, with a chronic disease on the, IC, on the normal ward has this level, and, and ICU patients has a totally deranged level. So this is, is poten the potential um, way for further research, but we don't have uh, any uh, any approach to the patient samples on the normal ward, and, and you know the normal ward in the UKA, and uh, uh, we don't have a real biobank bank there. I think it's it's important from my point to say, and I think it goes uh, still in your direction that that we have a large biobank, and it's nice to to go to your pond, put out your angle, and look into the pond and try what you can get, and. and try to get some new ideas and uh, try to, to find out something new. That's our approach. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, and you also, in that chapter, did not find a, f a difference between septic patients and non-septic patients in copatim levels. So I studied a bit and I saw that several other studies in the ICU found significant higher levels of copatim in septic patients compared to non-septic patients. Could, could you explain why this study didn't find uh, a uh, difference. Esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question. Um, in fact, we addressed that in the manuscript. Um, I think it reflects inflammation. Yeah? It reflects inflammation and not infection. And to be honest, a, a biomarker like copeptin, which um, reflects vasopressin, why should this biomarker be capable to distinguish between non-infectious and infectious inflammation. Yeah? Yeah. So it's vasopressin, which is the most potent uh, vasopressor in the human body, the most potent vasopressor we give our patients in the ICU. Why should this biomarker should distinguish between those? It's not, I don't understand it. I, and I think yeah, it's, it's uh, um, an indicator of inflammation, of severe excessive yeah. systemic inflammation. And that's, that's, um, a situation I can I can understand. I cannot understand why this should be regulated by infection. I, I don't yeah. know, but we commanded it, and honestly, I didn't understand the other studies. Okay. There was a, there was a large uh, Chinese studies yeah. in a in an uh, in an, um, in an uh, emergency uh, care unit um, who who um, observed this finding that uh, copeptin is high in those in, in, in this collective. Yeah, okay. but I have to say. To diagnose sepsis in an ER is not that easy. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Th thanks. Uh, uh, just one small question. Yeah. Uh, for the law, because you also wanted to investigate whether copatin uh, was associated with disease severity, and I also looked at the sepsis tree criteria. And you also have separate criteria for septic shock within the septic tree. Uh, yeah, it's addressing the sep um, septic the point, three, yeah. and then the septic shock. Yep. Did you also find that there was a difference between septic shock patients and septic patients in that? Uh, I didn't find it in the study, but you may opponent. give a short answer, please. You may give a short answer, please. Okay, uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, um, esteemed opponent, we didn't investigate it. We should have done it. You're totally right. We have. Sh sh we should should 
have looked at the septic shock, but we didn't uh, differentiate it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gevers. The next opponent is uh, Professor Schalkwijk. He is Professor of Experimental Internal Medicine at Maastricht University and Maastricht University Medical Center. Professor Schalkwijk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dear candidate, first of all, of course, my congratulations with this very nice piece of work, highly relevant, and with you, of course, also the promotion team. So we have actually focused on the identification of maybe new biomarkers in patients with critical illness. 10 different biomarkers. And you described uh, the definition of biomarkers in your presentation, also in your thesis, uh, very nicely. Uh, it should be easily obtained, rapidly measured, cheap, high sensitivity. Specificity is very important. Also, in the proposition three, you, you mentioned the criteria of a good biomarker. You've measured 10 biomarkers, and actually there is no information about the quality of the measurement. Um, I'm a little bit surprised. Highly esteemed opponent, interesting question. We didn't address this. It's not a question, it's just a remark. It, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a statement, you're right. It's a, it's Do you have information yeah, about uh, the quality of the measurements? Uh, yeah. Pardon me? Do you have information about the quality of the measurements? So just variation coefficients, uh, intra-SA variation. No. I'm sorry about that, we, we didn't have it. We cooperated with the Department of Biochemistry in our university hospital with the measurements, the ELISA measurements for us. Uh, but we don't, we don't address this in the, in, in this, in the cells in our manuscripts, that's right. Uh, but you are sure about the quality of the measurements? That's an important point, of course. The quality of the measurements, the quality of the biomarker measurements is key. Yeah, of course. In my yeah, of course. But we relied, highly simple point, we relied on the, on the, uh, on the information we get from the department. You're totally right. So, um, I humbly try to answer. I'm a physician, not a biochemist. We're totally right. Mm -hmm. That's totally right. Yeah, we should. Uh, and and yeah. okay, there is a lot of uh, uh, work on biomarkers and diagnostic biomarkers. Can you say something about, let's say, risk factors? Is that the same? Are it also targets for intervention? Um, so a biomarker actually is a reflection of a process going on in the body. Mm -hmm. A risk factor actually is a factor directly connected to the process, mm -hmm. involved in illness. Is it here the same? Are it all targets for intervention? Or is it just a reflection of a process going on in the body okay. during illness? Highly esteemed opponent, very intriguing, very complicated, very complicated, complicated to answer questions. Um, I can't distinguish which, uh, if, uh, if uh, a biomarker is a, a driver or is a or passive or is a is the effect of a reaction? I can't distinguish. We don't do mechanistic studies, so mm -hmm. I would very humbly say that we have a large database and we try to find something. We don't yeah. do mechanistic studies, okay. and that's okay. the shortcoming of all biomarkers papers. Yeah. If, yeah. if you okay. if you have a look to PubMed, you see all the biomarker papers, and they are mostly the same, and there are some high rank papers from high rank researchers, maybe from critical care. And yeah, mm -hmm. we said, okay, we have done 10 years of biomarker research, and is it a good research? I, I, I'm here to defend my thesis, but this is a shortcoming of biomarker research. Yeah. Of course. Okay, in, in, sorry, in chapter two, in chapter four, you focused on calprotectin, yeah. MJB1, chapter four. I'm more optimistic about calprotectin than you. Okay. Uh, it's actually released from activated granulocytes. It's a very early phenomenon in critical illness. It's also a ligand for rage. Mm. The same is true for HMM1. So what do you think about that process? You very nicely described actually hyperglycemia. Mm during uh, critical illness, mm. 
you found actually uh, uh, two markers directly linked to uh, the receptor of advanced clication yeah. end products. Yeah. So what is your idea about this underlying mechanism? Um, highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for this comment and question. Um, given um, high mobility box one protein, mm -hmm. this is a blueprint of um, a damp danger uh, molecular pattern. And we thought that this has to be the greatest biomarker ever to have because it reflects everything we have as a clinical issue at the ICU. And those biomarker was one of the disappointing biomarkers because it doesn't correlate with anything. Yeah. On, on the other hand, calprotectin, calprotectin did, was really uh, promising. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this is very hard to get it together and you raised the most important question. Yeah, to be honest, the mm. quality of measurements. Yeah? And we have to focus on that. If you, have a, if you, if you read the, the thesis, you have all the biomarkers, and every biomarker correlates with, uh, with something. There is a correlation. See, the measurements have to be good. Yeah? But on HB, uh, high mobility box, uh, uh, box one protein, we have no correlation. Maybe we had, mm -hmm. as you said, bad measurement in this. Yeah. And this would explain that calprotectin is regulated in our cohort. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe we have there a substantial error in the analysis of this specific biomarker. Thank you. Mr. Koch, you have seen and heard it. The time for defending your thesis has passed. The committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis, and in particular the quality of your defense, and please await our return. Thank you very much. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. Long road to the south side, seven miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. My goals only getting clearer. East side to the west side. No place like home if there's questions that you've got Go the extra mile and die Got my laces tied, long road, I don't waste no time. Break rules because fate decides. With the team and we chase the light. I make a move, fall down, shake it off. I hate to lose that branch, break it off. No room for negativity, praise and love. Prepare for deep park, cause we're taking off. Get the Side. 
Ten miles in my rearview mirror, I know what it felt like. My goal's only getting clearer, east side to the west side. No place like home, if it's questions that you've got, go the extra mile and die. Long road to the south side, ten miles in my rearview mirror, I know what it felt like. My goal's only getting clearer, east side to the west side. No place like home, if it's questions that you've got, go the extra mile and die.
Mr. Koch, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis, in particular the quality of your defense, and in view of this positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Cook is authorized to confer on you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch University custom and law, and I invite now to su the supervisor to take the floor. Professor Cook. <laughs> Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times to be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible? I do. Good. <laughs> By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confirm upon you, Alexander Michael Koch, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the University of Maastricht. Voilà. Herzlichen Glückwunsch, Dr. Koch. Wir gehen auf Deutsch weiter. Danke. Lieber Alexander, du hast es geschafft. Neben die viele klinische verantwortliche Arbeiten warst du imstande, die wissenschaftlichen Papers fertig zu machen und in diesem dicken Thesesbuch zusammenzubringen. Es war gut und lustig zu sehen, dass es dich gestresst hat, <lacht> wie ich auch am letzten Mittwoch beim Kochen bemerkt hatte. <lacht> Dieser Präverteidigungsstress gehört zum Prozess. Jetzt fühlst du dich hoffentlich erleichtert, ja. vielleicht erhoben. Du hast es überstanden und geschafft. Zurück in der Zeit. Ich war in dem Prozess des Aachen Maastricht Transplantationszentrums aufzubauen. Ein Patient mit akutem Leberversagen wollte ich von unserem IC zu euch verlegen, weil er nicht den langen Reise nach Rotterdam oder Leiden schaffen konnte. Es war logisch, dass er zu euch kam, obwohl ich noch nicht bekannt war mit dem Verfahren in Aachen. Ich rufte an und betete um den Chef der Intensivstation und wurde verbunden. Koch, innere drei, war der Anfangssatz, noch immer, wo wir miteinander in Verbindung kamen. Die Übernahme kam schnell zustande und wenn ich nachher auf deine Station diesen Patient besuchte, war er sehr zufrieden. Und die Patienten, die von deiner Abteilung kommen, sind zufrieden, weil die betreut werden von passionierten Ärzten und Team. Du hast du hat uns auch sofort verbunden. Das hat uns auch sofort verbunden. Während die Besuche von Patienten ist mich aufgefallen, wie effizient 
und mit Begeisterung Patienten behandelt werde in, schwer, in sehr schwierigen Umständen. Ich wurde von dir eingeladen, immer direkt anrufen zu dürfen, Patienten zu visitieren auf deine Abteilung. Die Visite auf deine Intensivstation war für mich eine Herausforderung, weil es so schnell vorangeht. Nachher immer ein Kaffee in dem Arztzimmer, eigentlich zu klein für die vielen Leute, zur Nachbesprechung anwesend. Du hast mich sofort mitgenommen und es war, als ob wir einander schon lange kannten. Wenn ich einmal sprach von Verteidigung einer meiner PhD-Kandidaten, warst du sofort interessiert und meinte, das möchte ich auch. Und voilà, hier sind wir. Obwohl die meisten PhD-Kandidaten den Thesis machen, bevor ihre Karriere im medizinischen Fach anfängt, war es für dich ein Schritt in ein Kontinuum von Ausbildung und Weiter Aus äh, Weiterbildungen. Du brauchst fast ein halbes A4, um deine Errungen medizinische Titel wiederzugeben. Es ist wie die Adelsfamilie mit den vielen Namen. Ich habe mich gewundert, warum du die vielen Ausbildungstitel haben willst. Ich meine, ein neues Syndrom entdeckt zu haben. Das heißt, kocht Titel Geilheitssyndrom, KTGS. Zum Glück ist es eine ziemlich benigne Störung, was im Laufe des Lebens vielleicht verschwinden wird. Das hoffe ich jedenfalls für die Angehörigen. Ob es genetisch ist, weiß ich noch nicht. Das werden wir in die nächste Generation beobachten müssen, bevor wir ein Grivas einsetzen. Auch zum Kochen sind wir zusammen in den Club Sava Fivre. Und auf diese Weise ist eine internationale Kochfamilie entstanden, das passt in den euregionalen Gegend und natürlich gehört es zu einem Nachnamen. Wir schließen heute eine interessante und herausfordernde Periode ab. Ich wünsche dich und deine Familie eine gute, gesunde und glückliche Zukunft und hoffe, dass wir noch viel Zeit verbringen können, um uns gegenseitig zu inspirieren. Herzlichen Dank. Esteemed Dr. Koch, dear Alexander, it's my pleasure to congratulate you with your doctorate and I congratulate you also on behalf of Maastricht University. And I would like to share some impressions of the committee with you. First of all, you gave us a nice summary of your thesis and I hope that also the audience in the live stream and here in the aula also have learned from all your work and from your summary and your explanations. And your thesis um, has put a number of biomedical data into a clinical perspective and I, we think that's very important. And we also think, well someone said, you are sitting on a gold mine of data and the next step is to study the other values of your research and the value of the biomedical data. Um, with your defense, we appreciate your very open and honest answers. And you are also very aware of the limitations of your studies. And we appreciate the discussion that we had. And you showed a very good knowledge of the field of your studies. So congratulations again, and I would also like to congratulate your two supervisors, uh, Professor Ger Koek, sitting here uh, opposite of me, and Professor Van Takke, and you see him on the screen of the Charité University Medical Center in Berlin. Both of you, I congratulate with the results that you have seen today in the form of, an, of a good thesis and of a very good defense. So again, congratulations. And I also would like to congratulate, I think all the people on the first row, your parents, your children, your wife, uh, congratulations with the results that you have seen. And you may be proud of him and of the young doctor, I would like to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I would like to thank all the members of the committee, both of the uh, thesis assessment committee and of this degree committee. Thank you very much for your input, for your critical, critical reading, for your critical answers and an interesting discussion. And in particular, I would like to thank the uh, external members of both committees. Thank you very much for your input. Maastricht University appreciates your contributions. Um, before I close this uh, ceremony, I would like to invite you for the reception. Um, you may, we go first to the hall of the building and we will take a picture with you in the middle. And I would like also to invite the, the closest members of your family. Um, so we take a picture there first with the committee and a second uh, picture with the close family also on the picture. And I would like to invite you for a reception in the open air and the beetle will show you how to come there. Um, and I hope it's not too warm and too sunny, but I think it will do. Hereby, I close this academic ceremony. Thank you. <laughs> yes. You will be careful with it, I think. I will be careful. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> Please.